about yourself, who you are, where did your ambition start um, as being a community leader in South Caicos? Okay. As far as I can remember, I've always been interested in community affairs. Uh, I, I believe in my last year in high school, there was an election being held in Grand Turk, and that sparked my interest in, in the politics because I attended one or two of the meetings. But I remember the old lady I was living with in South Cape and uh, Grand Turk at the time had a relative who was running, that's Dings Francis, and she took me to the results. All right, and I remember the crowd of people and the excitement after after they won. And shortly after that, I think the next election, by that time I was living in, in South Caicos, and I didn't take part in that election, but I was extremely uh, interested following Pell Carter, Mr. Mills, Mr. Lloyd, Hugh Basin, and all the other leading uh, politicians in South Caicos at that time. And shortly after that, uh, Charles Hutchings was the district commissioner. He had a, he had a uh, committee formed call it the South the Copenhagen Community Council, okay, and that was, uh, uh, that was a group of people, actually not po actually politically, the objective was not to promote political ideas and political uh, motives, but to seek to advance the community and to deal with uh, matters that affected the community as a whole. I became the secretary of that group, okay. And so that, I whetted my appetite, I guess. I got very interested. And I used to attend. At that time, I may have been a little bit different from the other youths in South Caicos at that time because the British government used to send like the Secretary of State or someone twice a year or so to meet with the public. And generally, they would have public meetings in Grand Talk and public meetings in South Caicos to hear the views of the community. And I used to attend those meetings. I probably was the only young person who would attend those meetings. And otherwise, it used to be the older members of the community there. People like Mr. Lloyd, people like Hugh Basden, uh, Mr. Mills, and those would be there expressing their opinions and telling the British government what they liked and what they didn't like, what they were doing right and what they were doing wrong. And I would be there. And eventually, in 1967, when the first election came, I didn't have any real ambitions of running in that election, but I was encouraged to do so, and I ran and eventually I, I won. But prior to that, I had already been involved throughout the community. I was, or had organized a cricket club, I got the cricket club moving. I was from secretary to chairman of the Wesley Guild. The Wesley Guild was the biggest youth movement, not only in South Caicos, but as far as I'm concerned, the biggest youth movement in the whole of the trucks in Caicos Islands. It was, it, was a, it was an extremely important youth group, and we used to meet once a, once a week, debates, have uh, social events, culture, discussing cultural issues, political issues, all that stuff, uh, at Wesley Memorial Mathis Church. Uh, I was a member of the Benevolence Association and of the Ward Fellows. Uh, so I was interested and, and, and I would say involved and everything that was happening in the community of South Caicos. So by 1967, uh, people felt that I should have been, I should have run for election, and I ran, and I, I was successful, and the story started from there. Awesome, right. Mr. Sanders. Yeah. Can you tell me about the life growing up economically and socially in South Caicos at yeah. that time? Well, South Caicos at that time was far different from it is today, and several of us. In fact, we were talking, a group of us, uh, just today and, and this whole week about the times when we were growing up, how it was so different. We talk about children who, you know, when they go to school now, they have a big breakfast, fairly, fairly good-sized breakfast, and then they have, their parents have to give them money to buy lunch, pasta leaders, and whatever it is, and then they come home, they got anything, almost anything they want to eat for, for, for dinner in the evening. When we were growing up, we, most of our parents, I don't think it was anybody who could afford more than that. Normally what you got was a 
cup of tea and a slice of bread and you went to school. That was your breakfast. And you came home for lunch and uh, that was for us, I would say for me, sometimes it was, a, it was a glass of lemonade and another slice of bread. That was your lunch. Sometimes my mother in between made coca lumps. Okay, so we had coca lumps for lunch off and on, like twice a week. And the rest of the time it was a glass of lemonade and, and another slice of bread. That was your lunch and you went to school. Of course, when we came home in the afternoon, we had a full meal, peas and rice and fish or grits and fish with plants and all the other stuff that, that goes along with it. So, but, you know, we contrast that with today and we ask ourselves whether we are healthier or whether the children of today with all the food and all the cereals and all the snacks that they have are healthier than we were 50 years or 60 years ago, right? But that, that was the way it was. And there wasn't a whole lot of work. Our fathers, if they had a job, it was basically in the salt industry or would be fishing. In my time, when I was growing up as a young person, Caicos Fisheries at that time was operating would be at, uh, you know, up in the town, near the government office. And uh, the salt industry was still in operation. So the, the, the man worked in the salt industry either to, in the salt pans or on the driving the trucks to move the salt from the salt pans to the town. Uh, we were carpenter. You can work in the carpentry industry to repair the truck carts or the windmills and things like that. Uh, and then when the ships came to take the salt, there were people who worked in the boats to move the salt from the shore to the boats and back. And so most of the men were employed in one capacity or the other in the salt industry. The salt industry closed down in 1964, I think. It closed down uh, for good. And when the salt industry closed, there wasn't much for, for much employment available for anybody. And most of the men left that time to go to the Bahamas in search of employment. So most of the young boys, uh, as soon as they left school, that's where they went. So there was a big migration of talks in Caicos Islands, young men and women to that to an extent too. How so. did you guys deal with unemployment issue at that time? How was that uh, tackled during that time? <laughs> There was issue. The, 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 the only employment that was available then was with, with the government in uh, work program, fixing the roads, doing things. So work was very, very scarce, extremely scarce. And as I said, we had no way of dealing with it except to leave. So most of the men left. They left to go to the Bahamas. It wasn't easy going to the States. But they left in the Bahamas, was, had, had an open door policy so to speak, especially for trucks and Caicos Islanders. And Freeport at that time was developing uh, rapidly. And so most of the men who went to the Bahamas could easily get a job. Uh, I would have gone, either for the grace of God I stayed here, but it didn't mean that I had no intentions of going to the Bahamas. The only difference was that most of the people who went to the Bahamas didn't get a work permit in their hands before they left. All right, they went on a boat, they would stop at Maragona or Inagua, somewhere about cleared, and they would enter as a crew on the boat, and the boat ended up in Freeport, and they came off, and that was it. So <laughs> they, they, they went to the Bahamas without any documents, and they stayed. Eventually, I guess, they, they got the documents once they were there, after a year or two or three, whatever the case is. But they went, and they walked, and they had no problems. The Bahamians, the Bahamian government never tried to round them up and send them back home. But in my mind, that was always a possibility, a possibility, and that was the last thing I wanted to happen to me. So I actually never left to go to the Bahamas because I couldn't get a paper in my hand before I left. So I stayed. So I said, you know, is that a destiny that kept me here? <laughs> or is my fear of the possibilities? <laughs> oh. But I, I remain, and I, I, I ended up in 1964 uh, with a job at, at Tisco. Well, I, in fact, I worked with Tisco just after I left school. Within two weeks, or so after I left school, I had, I had two jobs offered to me. One was at Tisco as a clock, or I could get a job in Grand Talk at the post office as a clock in the post office. But since this one was in South Cakes, I decided to, to take this job. And I worked with Tisco from 19, 
1960 until 1964 when they closed. And by that time, I did some courses in bookkeeping and accounts and advanced accounts. And I went to work with Maguire as, as, uh, as accountant in 1964 with the Kegas Company. Now, Maguire also had some involvement in politics. Maguire eventually got elected. He was elected in two, two, on two, at two elections. His first one was in Middle Caicos as the representative for Middle Caicos. And then in the following election, he got elected in South Caicos. South Caicos at that time had two seats. Uh, I, was, I had one, one seat and Maguire had the other seat. Yeah. That was in 19... I think that was about 1976. What yeah. inspired you most to become a politician? As I said, I was involved with the community in every area possible, in the, the church, in the lodges, in the cricket club, and in all the other social groups. And people eventually encouraged me that, hey, this was, this is, this, you know, this is, your, that's, this is where you should be. And so they voted for me, and it never stopped from 1967 until this year. Thank God. Contrasting between that period where you would say there was a great migration from South Caicos or from Turks and Caicos to, to the Bahamas, mm -hmm. compared to what is happening now or what's happened previously where you've seen a lot of South Caicos people migrate to Provo, how has that affected South Caicos and its development? Okay, uh, as you said, you know, we had South Caicos actually went through a period of people moving away in such of a better way of life, and that hasn't actually stopped. I'm hoping we are at the point where we can reverse that trend, okay? But uh, during my days in politics too, when they, we, were keep, we kept uh, talking to Tux Islanders in the Bahamas, promising them that things would happen in Tux and Caicos, that the development would pick, off here, pick up here. And Tux Islanders who were living in the Bahamas, who were hopeful that they would come back. Well, Prabhu started somewhere around 1980, because that was about the late 70s, when Club Mad came in. And we felt that with the coming here of Club Mad and the development that had been planned, that there would be a need for workers. We didn't have the workers at the time, and we were hopeful that Tux Islanders would come back from the Bahamas. In fact, I had I attended meetings. I held meetings in Nassau and in Freeport with Tux Islanders, and a lot of them promised that they would come back. And the same thing is happening now with Tux Islanders, the South Caicos citizens living in Provo. Uh, the East Bay Hotel would like for them to return. But once we found out that once a person gets grounded in a country or an island where they are, and they start to have children, and children go to school, and they are involved in the social activities, and it's not that easy to come back. They may have it in their head, but when it comes to reality, they're very, very reluctant, almost impossible for them to move back. So, probably started to go slowly from about 1980, 81, with Claude Mad, and then Prospect of, uh, not Prospect of Libby and North Cages, but uh, Provident Limited, and Providentialis, and Arabus Hotel, and the rest of them. So Provo began to pick up slowly, slowly, slowly. And then the momentum, I think, actually started, picked up a lot better around, 19, around 2000, mid-2000 coming up. No, mid-1990, mid mid-1995, 98, somewhere there. And so, by that time, what was available in the Tox and Caicos, not actually in South Caicos, but in Prabhu. Mm. And so it was very easy for South Caicos citizens to go to Prabhu and find work. And without breaking as a South Caicos person, uh, South Caicos people were, 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 were chosen, let's see, even above, above the, other, uh, or the other islands. They, they've, people who were hiring found in the South Caicos citizens were good citizens, were good workers hard workers and, and were easy to adapt to whatever situation they found themselves in. So, as I said, my, my understanding is that the employers were eager to have to, uh, South Caicos people working for them rather than, 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 than workers from the other islands. So, we did, pretty, we did pretty well. 
and there was always this wave of South Caicos young people as they left school. So you had a, you had a graduation at the school with uh, with a hundred children, and by a month or two later, all of them were in Provo looking for work. Okay, so none of, none of the children were staying in South Caicos. Only only the only children were staying there were those who were in school. The rest were leaving and going to Provo. Even the the young people who were here and were of walking age and looking for a job, they were moving to Pro South to to Provo. There was a time when I, I was even let's say this election, this election for the whole of South Caicos was uh, 369, 371 voters on the voters list. But there was a time when we had 800, 900 voters on the voters list. We had two constituencies. We don't have that now. Uh, so we've, been, we've gone through that period where our population has been continually depleted. But the, this time, the difference is we were not, the, the population wasn't being depleted to the Bahamas, it was being depleted to Provo. The 1980 census, if I figures in my head are correct, for, for Provo, what could have been the 70 something cents, was only 800 people. 800, that was all the population that Provo had. Today, the estimate's up to 30,000. See, so that there has been a, a, big, a serious transfer of the populations, not only of South Caicos to Provo, but of Grand Turk and Solkey and Middle and North, all moving to Provo because Provo was the economic engine. It was a place where we could find work and a place where everything else was happening. So that uh, affected the, 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 the population growth in South Caicos very seriously. Now, today, we are hopeful and people in Grand Turk, people in Provo are even watching the trend because of the East Bay Hotel, the hotel that Louis Cox has, and CMK, people called Say Rock, all that development coming coming on stream. We are hoping that we would actually hold the population we have and in addition to that attract others who are gonna come here. So I I'm I'm willing at this time to chance a bet that by the next election, 2020, 21, whenever it is, the population or the voters list, instead of being 369, 371, will probably be near four or 500, all right? And we'll start moving from there. If these people had stayed, would South Caicos be different today? South Caicos would have been a lot different, all right? And it would have affected the economic activity in South Caicos. Unfortunately, I'll have to say that we didn't have the work going on at the time to support that population. Okay, But if the people were living here, South Caicos would be a far different place than it is today. Uh, I, I guess as you walk around and you remember your childhood, you, there, were, there are houses in South Caicos where you would have remembered people living in those houses and now those houses are empty. Okay, we look at Bill Clear, Clinton Clear House, empty. That house probably had a dozen children in it. A few years ago, Mr. Mills' house, I, when Mr. Mills was alive, a few years ago, I went up there, I used to go to visit him fairly frequently. And I remember when he had wife and children, maybe 12 children or so, living in that house, and he was there alone. Uncle Hilly, right down the hill. All right, Uncle Hilly and Aunt Emilia had a house uh, full of children. It was only Uncle Hilly a few years ago. So and as you walk around South Caicos, you find a lot of houses like that. We, we, we remember big families. The houses are empty. Harvey Mills, not too, just on the opposite side of Mr. Mills. The houses are empty. And, and, and either the old parents have died, but their children have gone somewhere else. Their children are not here. You know, I remember when we had uh, 1964. I remember when we had a cricket club. We had a lot of young men in South Caicos. We had a cricket club that was was the envy of the islands. We 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 had no fear in challenging Grand Talk for a cricket match, and we were so good that the Grand Talk refused to play against us at that particular time. That's the, that is the truth. We we challenged them for a cricket match, and they turned us down. Because at that time we had, we could we could easily have two cricket teams any Saturday, 
any Saturday. 22, we got two cricket teams that are playing matches every Saturday. We had 20, 22, 24 young men sitting now playing every Saturday. And there were people who looked forward to that. And that made a big difference in, in South Caicos. Our churches used to be full. The Methodist churches used to be full packed every Sunday. You now they're empty, scattered because people have, people have moved. So you, um, your question was, if I, what would, have, would, would South Caicos be like had those people not had to leave? We would have been a big, vibrant, thriving island. <laughs> now you, you grew up in an era where, you, now you also witnessed an era where there was this big economic boom in South Caicos. And then all of a sudden, it just went down here yes. immediately, like yes. a steep yes. slope down here. That's right. What shifted this economic boom from South Caicos to Provo? Okay. What happened? South Caicos, prior to the 60s, leading up to the 60s, was the industrial center of the trucks in Caicos. Salt was the industry, fishing was the industry. And so South Caicos was dominating in the salt and in the fishing. Any young man, you probably have been around, you didn't, you didn't take part in the fishing industry, but there was a time when the most young men could have earned in a month more than anybody else in this country, no matter what position they held in government or we else, because lobsters were plentiful, conch was plentiful. And a young a guy at 17, 18, who, who can handle the boot and handle the goggles and fins, could make a lot of money. All right. So that was a period that South Caicos had itself in in the 60s. All right. As 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 the the island, the industrial island, with salt and fishing, two main product, two main products. Okay, we were exporting salt, we were exporting fish and cow. So we had a lot of money. People were coming from Provo and North Caicos to come here. Not so many from Grand Talk, but from Middle and North and Provo were coming to South Caicos. The young men were coming here to walk in and live. Now, as I said, the salt industry closed in 64. The fishing industry continued to do good, all right? Even until now, it had its periods of ups and downs, but the fishing uh, continued to thrive and continued to provide a livelihood for the young men who were divers and fishermen, but anything else the, that, that had left. Uh, and the Admiral's Arms was the first hotel in the Trucks and Caicos. And the Admiral's Arms was bringing in, we had staff in the Admiral's Arms hiring people. So I said we were the first hotel. But it, and, and we were providing fuel for the planes who had to fly from, from Miami all the way to South and Central America and they had to stop. It was the only place or the most convenient place for them to get fuel. And that was providing the activity that those were the tourists who lived at the Admiral's Arms. Okay, so, so we, had, we had all that activity. Unfortunately, when the salt industry closed and fishing and things went a little bit down a bit, and then there was a shift. They were making bigger planes. We didn't have to stop, didn't have to make a stop 500 miles out. Could go 1,000 miles. So that instead of stopping in South Caicos, they could fly from Florida to Puerto Rico. And so that affected that part of the activity, economic activity in South Caicos. So we actually suffered from that. And then I tell you, then Provo began to pick up. And so our population was moving from South and in, into Provo. Currently, what do you see is causing or inhibiting the advancement of South Caicos? At this point, I believe sincerely in my heart that South Caicos is beginning to recover and the trend has changed, okay? And I sincerely believe that that trend is going to get bigger and bigger and South Caicos will return to a point where it will have an impact on the economic activity. The people who live in South Caicos, let's say, will find more work will find more social activities, will find a, an island where they, they can do more, enjoy themselves more, and contribute more. Okay, because I, we, we, we have the East Bay Hotel, which I think is going to expand. 
CMK with all that land in the north of South Kegas with the development they have now and that is going to continue and continue so I eventually I intend to see them with marina golf course and all these things that they intend more houses probably another hotel okay so I ex I I believe sincerely that South Kegas is going to expand and with the success of the East Bay Hotel I expect that somebody sooner or later this year next year or the year after is going to say hey man this is a nice place to have another hotel, all right? And so from there, that is how Provo started. Third Tunnel Hotel, and then eventually uh, Erebus Hotel, and then uh, the, there was a hotel, I can't remember the name of it, one, one, one great space some time ago. But eventually, development follows development. And with, so with this thing, stuff happening now, I expect that there will be, I can't tell you people are gonna leave from Provo to come here. But people in South Kegas will start to find work so that the school children who leave every year, okay, they will always be those who are going to leave to advance their education and go away and hopefully when they come back they can find work and they'll find work rather than Provo, they'll see work available for them in South Kegas, all right? So honestly, it is my, sense, my opinion that South Kegas will, the, the trend will now improve. South Kegas will, will start picking up. Perhaps not as rapidly as Provo, but it will pick slowly, slowly pick up. We see in Provo where most of the development, though it has developed, is not locally owned. Correct. How can Sub-Kickers people gain and maintain this new and coming wealth and opportunities? that's presenting itself here on this island. Okay, there are a couple of things. That's, that, that is a very, very, very good question. And it's unfortunate that Provo has moved in that direction. That is not a direction I liked. And when I was uh, Chief Minister, I was doing my best to enable Turks and Caicos Islanders to come to the forefront as entrepreneurs, to be business people, to be professional people, so the lawyers and the doctors and the accountants and those who are making a lot of money in the financial services industry, uh, who are uh, having the big jobs and, and, and many of those places, the best paying jobs, we hope that the government would, would enable Tux and Caicos Islanders to be qualified in those particular areas. And as far as it comes to development, we have to encourage, or we had to encourage uh, people with the wealth to do the big developments, the 200 room hotels, the 100 room hotels, or the well, okay, that side of thing. But we, I was actually pushing, and it's still my philosophy, political philosophy, to encourage Turks and Caicos Islanders to be entrepreneurs, to be engaged in business, and to pro help them with the opportunity to achieve that. And one of the ways that we had conceived at that time, what we had was the encouragement, well, the encouragement of development ordinance or encouragement of development law was to facilitate uh, foreigners to come here. But we had a business licensing uh, law. And the business licensing law was designed to enable Turks and Caicos Islands to protect them from, from I don't want to, the competition may be the wrong word, but to protect them so that there would be certain businesses within their, their uh, capabilities that they would be able to get in. And you'd keep the foreigners uh, from, from engaging in those activities so that Turks and Caicos Islands will have an opportunity all right, to, to, to be entrepreneurs. And that is very important as far as I am concerned, even today, to ensure that we have a stake not just as workers, as employees, but as business people, as business owners, all right? And I am proud to say when I look back, I had a good hand, a good influence in creating people like Butterfield, one of the biggest local businessmen. We got in the Turks and Caicos Islands, can compare with anywhere. We had people like Clifford Gardner in North Caicos, we encouraged him to have his hotel. We had Storm Music in Grand Turk. And we were doing things like this all over to bring Turks and Caicos Islanders to the, to, to the forefront in business. Because, as I said, I felt then and I still feel today that people, we have to say, he who pays the piper calls the tune. If someone has the reins on the economic pressures of your country, 
they will have a serious influence and a serious impact on your country. And if, 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 if that is in the control of foreigners, they can have a disastrous effect on your country. And so it is vital, it is vital for the politicians today and the politicians of the future to ensure that there is an avenue for Turks and Caicos Islanders to rise to that. Now we know that some, not everyone has the business acumen to succeed in, as, as a big and powerful business person, but there are, and it has to, the, the, the government has to keep a watchful eye on individuals. You have to have that keen sense, hey, you know something? There's a guy that I, can, I, see, I like his attitude, he's good. Let's see if we can pay him, help him to raise the capital to get into the business that he would like to get in and to, 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 to succeed in that area. That's very, that is very, very important. And I, I know the government uh, just started with the, the small business, Michael Small Business Enterprise, to help people to get, if they have an idea, and they can prepare a good, a good business plan that uh, impresses uh, the government, then they can get a grant to help them to get a start, get their foot on the ground and move. And as they succeed, they can grow and move onwards. So that, that, is, that is the first step. And as you know, we had uh, TC Invest was doing a similar thing to help people to get money to, to uh, engage in business enterprises. And TC Invest was very, also very important because not only uh, was TC Invest using money provided to them by the government, but TC Invest was able to tap into external firms like CDB or other, the World Bank and other, other organizations who would provide capital for developing countries like Turks and Caicos Island. So we will, we will hopefully move to that, to that stage fairly quickly. But it, I come back to the point, it's very, very important. I think it is vital for the future development of the country that we get as many Turks and Caicos Islanders as possible as entrepreneurs. Thank you. Yeah. There, is, there is a strong belief that most of the criminal activity is by expatriate young boys, especially from other islands uh, with no work. Some of them have no inclination even to work mm -hmm. because they, so they grew up in an environment where they want to steal. They steal from those who have to provide for the, their own needs. Okay. Uh, but that is unfortunate and I remember in the early days when we were talking about tourism, we were talking about development, there were people who were always pointing to the disadvantages of, uh, of, of development or of, let's say too rapid a development because crime is, the by, is one of the byproducts, the bad parts of, of development. Right? And I remember when I was chief minister and minister of tourism, people used to say, why do you want to do this and you know this is going to happen, crime and things are going to follow. And then we had to say, well, we need the development because we need to provide employment for our people. We need to provide uh, a way so that they can have a, make a livelihood. And so we would do the things we have to do to minimize the rise in crime. Unfortunately, we were concentrating on the development without figuring out how to deal with the consequent rise in tourism. So we were, we were worried about and putting all our efforts into getting the development going, but doing nothing to minimize crime or to keep crime at, a, at, the, at bay. Unfortunately, it is now affecting us and affecting us fairly seriously. And it can get worse because if it affects the tourism industry to the extent where tourists don't want to come and it's going to, the numbers in tourism uh, arrivals will decrease, then we will feel that effect in our pockets, in the employment that the tourism industry has been providing. So getting the crime thing on, uh, in hand is very, very important to the country. I would even say it, it is critical for the country. But the belief is that it is not, the, the crime isn't being perpetrated by Turks mm -hmm. Islanders. It's mainly perpetrated by foreign young people. Mm -hmm. And so the immigration problem, being able to control the people who come here, 
is, 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 is more important uh, than that. So we, we grow up in an environment where we go to school, we need to love your enemies and help protect your enemies. I mean, to protect your neighbors, love your neighbors, and do good to them. We don't, stealing is the last thing we're gonna do. We have some bad boys or girls that do that, but not to that extent. And killing is something not, that's not part of our nature. All right, so we, we have to bring it, but it is not my area, but it is a, it, it's a serious problem and it's, it's seriously affecting uh, li livelihood in the country and we have to, 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 to study it and find ways and means of rooting it out. Okay? Yes, yeah. Mr. Sanders, if you were to put yourself in the shoes of a, let's say, 18, 21 year old, mm -hmm. in this era right now, what opportunities would you create for yourself in this environment? There are a number of opportunities and the, 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 the opportunities range from one stage to another. Let me start out. Unfortunately, let's say South Kegas for example. Currently there is a lot of work available and very few talks, very few South Kegas boys can benefit from it, right? Let's talk about carpentry, plumbing, operating, uh, heavy machinery, electrical engineering, all those trades that we, use, our mothers and fathers used to send us to trade schools to learn. The young man of today in the last few years never wanted to do that, unfortunately. I think we have to educate them, we reach the point where we have to educate them, that these are, these are good areas. If you, you know, if, if, if there are opportunities for you, if you want to be lawyers and accountants and doctors and engineers and the rest of it, those opportunities are there too. But you can't, not everybody is going to be a lawyer or a doctor or an accountant. There are some people who have to learn a trade and you can earn a decent wage to support a family properly if you are able to do that work and you're prepared to do it. When I went to high school, I told her, my mother said to me, I was 12, 12, going on to 13. She said, I'm sending you to go to school, but I've made arrangements for you to go and walk on the weekends with a carpenter, lawn carpentry. Your father was a carpenter, your grandfather was a carpenter. Just in case you don't make it academically, you got something to fall back to, right? So there's nothing wrong with the young man, some of them around who were fishermen before, learning a skill in the area of in carpentry, masonry, electrical work, plumbing, uh, stuff like that, okay, tiling, and all these things, because though, uh, heavy machinery operating, all right, all that stuff is happening now, they can find work. But apart from that, I go to the other areas too. And we can brag that we have done pretty well in the last 10, 15, or 20 years. Educate, providing education for our children so that today we have doctors, we have lawyers, we have accountants, we have engineers, we have all of these line of people all over, right? And at the same time as I speak to you now, I am also aware of the fact that there are a lot of foreigners engaged in those same activities, right? So we have to ensure that our people are qualified for all the jobs at all the spectrums of uh, and the job areas that are available in this country today so that they can earn a decent living all right um, uh, i remember not too long ago we had a study done let me see the name of the study it was the maybe the poverty assessment i'm not sure if that's the name of it but i know what i'm trying to the, 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 say about that study. The study was saying that we, Tux and Kegas Islanders was in the bottom tier of the employment scale. We were basically, well, the carpenters, lawyers, the secretaries, and that kind of thing. And the pay scale at that level, let's say it was here, 
but the others were getting the pay scale was up here and that area of employment was filled 99% or more by foreigners okay and so what we have to do is to ensure that our people are properly educated now I am one who don't believe that John Job laws can come and say because I'm a truck seller and I learn how to do this I should get that job over there if you don't if you're not properly qualified for it so my position would be to encourage trucks and cake sellers to be properly educated and when you say I want this job you must be equally qualified you don't want to bring the standard down because you're only half radio put yourself to the top so that you want you want to train yourself at an international level so that you when you say I want this job you qualify for the job you know you can handle that job and so the quality of work doesn't have to go down because the tox island is in it the, tox, the quality can go up because that tox island has educated himself and brought himself up to the standard we are he can certainly handle the job that he is asking for but to answer your question we need to we need to educate our people at all the various areas and I tell you this now without any without any uh, fear because I've attended a number of committee meetings in Grand Talk in the government and when I go around and the people who I'm, who I'm looking at 60-70 percent of those are foreigners you know and that shouldn't be so that is has to be the focus of the government today and in the next couple of years to make sure that we bring it if 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 Toxanas can fill all of those jobs that I see expatriates in a lot more of that money the paycheck will stay here well foreigners in those positions 75 percent of their paychecks is leaving the country and so the country is suffering and now people are not there. So there, 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 there's still a long way for us to go to prepare our people to take over the reins of the country. So plenty of job opportunities are still available for tax islands. What can the government or people do um, to curb this this problem? I'll come back to training. We have to. We. I think it, there are two. There are two things we have to do: educate our people on the opportunities that are available to them, and do everything we can to provide the opportunities for them to go to school and to be educated and trained. Now, we have, even while we say this, we have to be careful because I am one who believe in what we call control development. I don't hear any of the other politicians today talk about that but for me control development means you move with the pace of your people you don't move and say well you know you're gonna you're gonna allow some development to take place that's gonna need 3,000 jobs but you don't have 200 people to put in it all right so you got 200 and you need 3,000 that mean 2,800 2,700 it's got to come from outside I'm not sure if that is that is good planning. That that is the point I'm trying to make. I think we have, we have outstripped ourselves. The demand for labor far exceeds the labor that we can provide, the skills that we can provide. So we have to depend on those skills. So the only thing we can do now, because that development is already here, is to find replacement talks in Kegas Islanders so that hey two years time your contract is up we've got we've got to pay a tox Islander who can be up to your level or exceed your level to take your job that is what has to be done in the next couple of years to my opinion thank you Mr. Right. Salas do you have any final words to say to the people of South Kegas if I had anything to say, I would say I think we are at the in, in South Kings at the threshold, or at the beginning of a change. Okay, the airport the government is spending somewhere near thirty million dollars in getting the airport fixed up. New, 
new runway that is going to be followed by a new airport terminal all right and that is one of the first things you need if you're going to get into tourism development the hotels need to know that they can bring people in and take them out and then you need a nice place for them to stay and once that that groundwork is done the infrastructure is there uh, i think cmk or sail rock as people refer to it east bay hotel lewis cox place i expect that that is going to continue and as it continues there is going to be more and more jobs created hopefully south Caicos people would be the first if south Caicos people are not there then i hope it will be tucks and Caicos islanders who would be walking there so i would like and as the population in south Caicos increases everything else is going to go along with it the economic activity is going to increase so there will be a demand for more services okay we had a few years ago i'm going to tell you the population because it decreased tropical used to come into south Caicos. so didn't have to go into and uh, into into provo and we bring all our stuff you find now everybody's shopping in provo and bringing the stuff here but if the population increases then tropical or some other freight boat will come to south Caicos directly from miami and the prices in Man south Caicos would can be the same as you have in provo you have more shops more shops mean more competition between between the shopkeepers you understand then the, the churches would be more people to attend church to contribute so the social life will will improve you'll have things to do activities we we have cricket team cricket games i told you once before every every saturday i remember the basketball teams every saturday night up on the basketball court you don't see it anymore because our young boys had to leave hopefully that can you come back all that activity creates uh happiness creates activity things for young people to engage in make them feel comfortable they can enjoy their time enjoy the weekends and so we will, we will start to rise from that that is that is what i feel we are on the brink of at the present moment okay thank you mr that's, that's my belief i think south kickers is at a point that we should begin to feel good we will feel good and things are beginning to turn around